do support work with a number of charities. Um, and one of the things that's impressed me very much over the last um, sort of year or so doing this is the relationship between trustees and the members of a charity in those charities which have a, a membership structure. And the thing that's impressed me most is that with charities that seem to have adopted one of the standard downloaded from the Charity Commission uh, website, Memorandum and Articles of Association, is how totally impotent the members are in relation to the management of the charity. They can, it seems, they can do virtually nothing except when the next AGM comes around, maybe propose that the directors have voted or the trustees have voted off. And this has caused some interesting issues. And I'm just wondering, in the context of building a strong trustee board, which is alive and working for the activity the charity, what it should be bearing in mind in terms of developing its relationship with the members of the charity and, 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 and making sure that they are properly empowered to have their voice heard without encroaching on the legal position, which is that the, cha the trustees are the absolute kingpin rulers of the charity, and what they say goes, and that's the end of it. Can we take the other one from Dominic as well? Yeah, I'll uh, Dominic Pinto, um, a couple of observations and a question, I think. Having worked in some of the last few years for a membership organisation and helped work on building a collaboration, a sort of consortium as part of that, I think a lot of it was about um, finding there was some commonality of purpose and I think empathy and sort of some sort of sharing of, I suppose it is emotional, about the things because we were, had worked with some of these people before to one degree or another, they had worked with us, so there was understanding and that had taken time to build up. But we did get facilitation. In fact, CAS helped facilitate getting all that together, which was actually quite important. Um, and under, I suppose, the cost of effectively sort of the squeeze in the sector on funding and things like that. So, you know, in the good times, no one thinks of these things except it's probably the good times you should be thinking, really, I suppose. Um, uh, the, question, sorry, the question I have is actually where where I live and where I'm a trustee of a couple of organisations, particularly this question of uh, young trustees or even youth yeah. trustees. And I think one thing, I mean, it's something I pushed a bit, being um, saying that the, uh, the average age, 57, that very conscious we do need more people, we need um, other skills and also people with other experience, particularly from the younger settings. That, but my fellow trustees argue with think, but you can't have young people because they're not responsible. And, and, and they're not, lead, but, but not responsible in the sense of legally responsible, and that seemed to be the sticking point. You can't be a trustee and take responsibility if you're not legally responsible, or could be legally responsible as an individual. And I, I just kind of wondered at that. It didn't seem to be anything I'd read could actually sort of, that was actually a, a, a relevant consideration, really, is whether they were committed, passionate, and interested, and wanted to contribute, and we did have, and still do, quite a few people who tried to do that. Could, could I answer on the membership thing? And I'll actually take the, your last point because um, if it's a um, charitable company, um, then the minimum age is 16. And in fact, you know, there's a new legal structure, the Charitable Incorporated Organisation, which is going to, we're going to have applications in January for this after 20 years. Um, and in fact, we had a lot of discussion on that about the age. Yeah. Uh, and it has been settled as 16. Um, so 16, but in fact I have seen um, cases where it's been an even younger for in charitable companies. I have seen the 14. So it's usually 18 if it's a trust, so it, it does vary. But on the membership point, I mean, I'm particularly interested in membership organisations because there's a tension between the charity law position that you've got to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries and in a membership organisation, the rights of members. Mm. Um, and in fact, there is just an inherent conflict there because uh, originally all charities way back the trusts, right? they weren't membership charities, we're looking centuries back. Um, and in fact, again, this is something that 
we had a lot. I mean, we had we spent a lot of time on the CIO looking at the position of members and how members actually fit into a charity. And for the in the CIO, members are going to have a fiduciary duty for the first time. So it actually says that when they make decisions as members, it's got to be in the best interest of the charity, not of themselves. And another point is that the company law rights to remove trustees and to um, appoint proxies aren't included um, automatically for a CIO. And, and just one more point on this, I, I worked with the National Union of Students because they've got their own version of the Code of Governance and they added a seventh principle of democracy because they saw that for students' unions, democracy and, and the rights of members was essential. And this is quite interesting because that isn't usual for most charities. Just uh, quickly on, on, on your point, for mergers to succeed, uh, apart from leadership, you need good communication at all levels. Um, uh, I've always taken the principle that you should communicate as much as you can um, to as many people as you can. Uh, um, so I think that there's a process. But in terms of collaboration, I think it's important to remember that collaboration is not a one-off activity. It also is a process. It's an ongoing thing. And the, the nature and depth of the collaboration can vary over time. And uh, so collaboration is something you have to work at. What you have to be careful of is that the time you invest in it is disproportionate <coughs> to the benefit you actually get out of it. I just want to say one, one other thing about Alex's excellent presentation as having been a woman in the city and being on, on boards and being the only woman. Uh, and having been chair of the board uh, of, of uh, a charity for One World Action for seven years, my biggest regret as chair of trustees was that I wasn't sufficiently proactive in inducting new trustees, making them feel welcome, and uh, keeping in touch with them. I mean, if it's my own weakness when I look back. It's very easy to be the token woman or the token young person or whatever. I mean, I happen to be female, gay, and semi-disabled, so I, make, I tick a lot of boxes. <laughs> but, um, and I'm quite a tough girl as well. But it's still quite, it can be quite difficult. And I, I think it's not so much about getting people on board, it's keeping them on board and making them feel part of the board. That is, that, that, that is the, the thing that's missing so often. And I think the current debate focuses too much about getting, getting women on board. It's, it's, it's not that. It's, making them, changing the board after they've been appointed. Thank you very much. I think uh, on the young trustees point, I think, you know, to be realistic here, it's not going to be in every case that every member of the board or every body of the senior management structure of a charity will be in favour of younger people or be in favour of board diversity in every case. Um, what I would say is, though, is that one of the most important things is just if you're open to the possibility and say you meet a wide range of potential trustees, I think the thing there's something in the, the name trustee itself that sort of suggests it's quite it's quite important to trust somebody and for actually for it to be quite a personal thing. So if you advertise for a trustee position, for example, if people can come along and actually meet the other board members, can meet the senior staff of the organisation, I think beyond their skill set and their experience you generally can get a sense from talking to people about their passion and their aptitude for dealing with the issues of the organisation. And I suppose my, my plea is really that younger people and any, any group which is currently underrepresented on boards just be given a fair chance, I suppose, is what I'm trying to put forward. At the same time, um, um, per conference, the lawyers say, um, there's one other concept that we haven't actually been discussing much this afternoon, which is really important in the context of good governance, which is about succession. And I think one of the issues that is where it comes up, particularly in membership associations, is about succession. Because, um, as Alexander said earlier, you know, look beyond your own friends. Well, actually, in a membership association, that can become rather difficult to do because you've got to look amongst the members. And uh, 
having rules about succession and more importantly actually enforcing them which in many of the membership associations I've worked with doesn't happen too much um, I think we need to throw that into the pot so we talked about recruitment we talked about retention yes and let's also have some churn as well because that's part of good governance as well about membership groups I think it was um, uh, was you about selecting from the um, trustees from the membership if it's a membership organization is that absolutely necessary um, to select a, a board of trustees from a membership it would depend on the constitution but quite often in a membership organization you'll have power of co-option and that can often be used to bring in additional skills that you may not find in the membership. So, I mean, even in a membership organisation, the, the composition of the board could change a lot. I mean, sometimes you would have some appointed from outside. Um, so you can, I mean, you can do whatever you like. There's a huge amount of flexibility, and, and which is why sometimes it's worth, in a membership organisation, having a governance review and seeing are there different ways.